and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access a recording of today's conference and previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. Today, we're honored to welcome Dr. Jordana Phillips for a lecture on contrast enhanced mammography, time for implementation. Dr. Phillips is Chief of Breast Imaging at Boston Medical Center and Associate Professor of Radiology at Boston University. She's an expert in contrast enhanced mammography, performing research on the topic, as well as lecturing nationally on implementation strategies. At the end of the lecture, please join her in a Q&A session where she will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit, submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Phillips, please take it from here. Thank you. Let me just pull up my slides. So I am so thrilled to be here with everybody today talking about contrast enhanced mammography. It's a topic that I find incredibly exciting for our field and um, hopefully all of you will too. I know there have been a lot of questions about it. It's kind of becoming a hot topic. People are implementing it. So feel free after the lecture is over, if we don't have enough time for questions to reach out to me, I'm happy to answer anything. Um, so let's get started. These are my disclosures. Um, so this is what we're gonna be talking about today. We'll start with the basics, um, move on to some of the challenges of contrast enhanced mammography. As we know, there's always some difficulty when you're starting something new. Um, we'll talk about how people are using it in clinical practice, and then we'll move on to um, where it's headed in the future and some other kind of key ideas to mention. So we're gonna start by talking about the basics. The wonderful thing about contrast enhanced mammography, and I should start by saying, you'll notice at the top of the slide, it says CEM, contrast enhanced mammography. Some people use the word uh, contrast enhanced spectral mammography or CESM or contrast enhanced digital mammography or CEDM. These are all the same thing. So um, I use CEM, so um, you'll see that throughout the talk. So the wonderful thing about contrast enhanced mammography is that it's just an adaptation of we, what we already know, which is conventional 2D mammography, which are the standard four views. But there are two key differences with a contrast mammogram. The first difference is that the images are acquired entirely after the injection of iodinated contrast. So a patient comes into the department, they have an IV line placed, which is a difference that the patient notes, through the IV line, they have the iodinated contrast administered. Two minutes from the start of the injection, they have what they perceive to be their normal mammogram. But this is where the second difference comes into play. This mammogram is actually performed using a dual energy technique. And so what does this mean? Well, for every imaging position, every time um, the breast is compressed in the CC or the MLO view, the, the unit is actually acquiring two pictures. The first picture is a low energy image, which looks just like a conventional 2D mammogram. You can see it here. Studies have actually shown that it's really similar, no different, non-inferior to a conventional 2D mammogram, which is great. You'll notice on the low energy image that there's already contrast in the breast, but you cannot see it on this 2D image, on the low energy image. And that's because this low energy image is performed below the cage of iodine, so it doesn't capture any of that iodine that's in the breast. The second image that's acquired is a high energy image. You'll notice it's blued out on my screen and that's because it's non-interpretable. This high energy image is performed above the cage of iodine. So it captures all of that contrast material that's in, in the breast, but we don't, we don't ever see this picture. The unit automatically post-processes the low energy and the high energy images together to create something called a recombine image. And this image is similar to a subtraction image on MRI where it really just highlights, it shows really well those areas of contrast enhancement. The low energy image and the recombined images are what we see as radiologists. Those are the images that get, so, get to our workstation, um, get sent to our workstation for imaging review. So what's excellent about contrast enhanced mammography is that we get to combine what we know, which is information on morphology and density, and we get to combine that with information on enhancement, 
and we don't need an MRI to do it. It's all performed at the same time. This imaging modality, contrast enhanced mammography, was actually approved over a decade ago at this point. Um, it was approved for use in the diagnostic setting in 2011. It's only really increased um, throughout the country in the past few years. So let me show you um, an example of a contrast mammogram. This was a 55-year-old woman who had a mass on her screening and she was recalled and she had a diagnostic contrast enhanced mammo. These are her low energy images. Again, they look just like a 2D mammogram. Remember that uh, the iodinated contrast has already been administered. There is already contrast within the breast. We just don't see it. So these are the low energy images and you can see that there's a mass in the right breast. Can't really appreciate its margins that well. But then look at the recombined images. These are the images that show the enhancement. And you can see that there's definitely a mass here. You can see the margins of the mass. You can see how the mass is taking up that contrast. It's heterogeneous, necrotic in the center. And what you'll also notice is that there's no enhancement throughout the remaining aspect of that breast. So not only does it help us better classify what we're seeing, better understand it or characterize it, I should say, it also helps us ex exclude cancer in other portions of the breast. This is really great. This was a triple negative breast cancer. So this is how a contrast mammogram is acquired. So again, we start with an injection. IV line goes in the arm. Um, we inject iodinated contrast material at a dose of 1.5 cc's per kilogram and at a rate of three cc's per, se three cc's per second through a uh, power injector. Two minutes from the start of the injection, we start acquiring the standard for images of a mammogram. You'll see here each um, imaging set, so the low energy and the high energy image are considered an imaging set. Each of these is actually acquired one minute apart, such that the total exam takes roughly five to six minutes. If you're going to perform additional images, which sometimes I do, for example, I, I acquire 90 degree laterals for my diagnostic exams, those happen after the standard four views, and they have to happen within 10 minutes because we want to make sure that whatever contrast is in the breast, we can see it and it hasn't washed out. What's important to remember after the images are acquired, they get sent to our workstation, as I mentioned before, is that a contrast mammogram includes interpretation of both the low energy and the recombined images. They are both a part of it. So even if you see a suspicious abnormality on the low energy images, right, calcifications, and there's no enhancement, that is still considered a positive contrast enhanced mammogram. And there was actually a meta-analysis that was done that looked at data on contrast enhanced MAMO and found that when this, when um, both the low energy and the recombined images are included in, enhanced, in the uh, interpretation, the sensitivity is 95% and the specificity is 81%, which is fairly high. So it's really important to remember that both are included in your interpretation. But let's get into a little bit more about the difference between contrast enhanced mammography versus conventional MAMO. There are some obvious benefits. To start, we can see cancers that would otherwise be obscured by glandular tissue on a mammogram. Let me show you an example or another example of this. This was um, a patient who had an asymmetry in the central portion of her left breast. You can see it's marked here by the circle. She came back for a diagnostic contrast mammogram. These are the low energy images. Again, look just like a 2D. And you can see the mass there in the central aspect of the breast. Um, the question is, is it a mass? Is it an asymmetry? On the low energy images, it really looks like a discrete finding. When we do the recombined images, we can see that there is definitely an abnormality there. This is a true finding. And we can also see that it's limited to that portion of the breast. And there are no other suspicious area, areas of enhancement throughout the remaining aspect of that breast. So again, helps us characterize a lesion and also um, improves our understanding of if there are other abnormalities throughout the remaining aspect of that breast or the contralateral breast. Studies are consistent. I'm not even going to show you one specific study on this, but the studies are consistent in that contrast enhanced mammography performs better than MAMO for all performance metrics. And this isn't surprising because it's kind of like CAD where it's just uh, taking the information that we already have and providing more information. So we still have our conventional 2D images we're just providing more information, which, which is the enhancement to help us um, identify more cancers and to help us exclude things that are just superimposed breast tissue. Another real, um, another nice 
uh, characteristic of this exam is that it can be performed at the same time as the diagnostic appointment. So you'll see, I already mentioned that if I have an abnormality that I identify on screening, I can bring the patient back and do a diagnostic contrast enhanced mammogram right then. I can better evaluate the finding and I can actually use it as a staging exam. I can see if there's, um, I can see the full extent. I can see if there are other areas to worry about. And I could do it all at the time of the diagnostic appointment. I can show the patient the imaging findings. It's also, when compared to mammography, um, it's a timed exam and it's relatively fast. So we looked, um, our group looked at how long it actually takes to do a contrast mammogram, how it, comp how it compares to diagnostic mammography. You'll see the DM is for diagnostic mammography. So we can figure out how much time we need to schedule or a lot for this exam. So we compared these two. We also compared it to CT and MR, but I'm not gonna focus on those. And we looked at different elements of the exam. We looked at EST, which is getting the equipment set up, PST, which is uh, getting the patient set up, ET is exam time, and PT is the post-exam time. And what you see when you look at all these times taken together is that the contrast mammogram was roughly 30 minutes longer than a diagnostic exam. But when we broke that down, we actually found that the reason for the increase in length is because of that equipment setup time and patient setup time. And that the actual time for the exam, because it's a timed exam, was actually exceptionally similar. So what that told us is that, as you would expect, if we use the MAMO room to put in the IV line and to talk to the patient ahead of time, it's going to extend the time of the contrast enhanced MAMO exam. What's better to do is to actually be able to do all of those preparatory steps in another room so that you're only using the MAMO room for the time of the, exact, uh, the actual exam, which would be similar to a diagnostic exam. Another benefit is that um, you don't need a whole new machine or unit. It's not like MRI where you have to get the whole, your whole, um, the whole room out, outfitted for this specific modality. This is just, if you have a MAMO unit that's capable of being upgraded to allow for dual energy, um, you can you take the machine um, out of use for about a day or two. You have some software, firmware upgrade. You have to add in a new filter to allow for the high energy images. This is a picture of a copper filter. Also titanium filters can be used, but this is really um, a simple thing to allow you to get these, uh, this added information. Last thing I'm gonna mention about radiation dose. So Radiation dose is really a tough topic because we all try to compare radiation dose across modalities, across vendors, and it's very difficult to do because all of the vendors acquire images in a different way. And so it's very hard to compare one to another to say there's more or there's less. So what we did to get a sense for the actual radiation dose of contrast MAMO is we took about 40 plus patients in our practice who had imaging on all of the different vendors that we have, and they had all different types of images, 2D, 2D plus DBT, and we compared the radiation dose, we calibrated all of it and compared the radiation dose across all of these exam types. And we stratified our results by breast tissue thickness. And what we found is that one of the exams that we perform all the time, which was a 2D plus a DBT for screening, um, we found that that was the highest radiation dose across breast tissue thicknesses, that's that blue arrow still well within the range. So I don't want to suggest that this is a, a too high of a dose, um, but just this is what it was. A second vendor, which was these were the 2D images only, had the lowest radiation dose across breast tissue thicknesses. And this is where contrast MAMO fell. So contrast MAMO was actually um, the dose of one of these exams, which include uh, low energy and recombined, I'm sorry, low energy and high energy images was actually similar to was within the range of what we were uh, providing to patients on a daily basis. So from my perspective, the take home for radi radiation dose is not that it's higher or lower than a different exam, but that it's well within the range of what we're doing for women every day, but we get this added information on enhancement, which we are not getting from our tests that only provide morphologic uh, and density information. So let's talk about contrast enhanced MAMO compared to MRI. Well, there is, the studies have shown a similar accuracy of contrast MAMO to MR. What this means really, it's a measure of how well contrast MAMO, accuracy is a measure of how well it finds cancer and how well it doesn't find non-cancer. So let's look at that. Sensitivity, 
is um, ability to find cancer. And these are two meta-analyses uh, performed in 2020 and 2022 with a different number of included studies. And they found that, um, the first study found that the sensitivity for contrast MAMO and MRI was the same, 97%. And the second one, more recent one, found that there was a difference in sensitivity. Contrast MAMO had a sensitivity of 91%. MRI had a sensitivity of 97%, um, which was a little bit different and actually not unexpected. Given that MRI is um, a cross-sectional imaging exam, we're getting much more information than we can on contrast enhanced MAMO, which is a 2D uh, planar exam. But when we look at the specificity, we see that the specificity um, is actually higher for contrast enhanced MAMO as compared to MRI. And this, again, really the take-home message that I would say a majority of us leave when looking at all of the individual studies and at these meta-analyses is that MRI does do a little bit of a better job at finding individual breast cancers and by really a few extra, um, but it has a much, contrast enhanced MAMO has a much better specificity. So that overall, the diagnostic accuracy of these two exams is fairly comparable. We'll get into um, the specific clinical uh, how we're using it in clinical practice and how the data compares. Let's look at an example of a contrast enhanced mammogram compared to MRI. So this is a low energy image from a contrast mammo. We see a mass. These are the recombined images where we see a mass, but we can also see enhancement extending towards the nipple. And so let me show you, this is the MRI exam, which shows the exact same findings. And I would say for people that are new to contrast mammo, whenever you look at the recombined images, often enough, if you were to then perform an MRI, the, the images are almost identical. Identical is maybe a strong, they're very similar. And so how you would describe the imaging finding on the recombined images is similar to how you would describe it on an MRI. Contrast enhanced mammography is also more affordable uh, than MRI. We bill it as a diagnostic mammogram plus contrast. There's no formal code for it yet. It's also more accessible. As I mentioned, it's just an add-on to a mammography unit that can be upgraded. We, it allows for real-time interpretation, as I also mentioned. Um, and so often enough, MRI is read offline. We read them when the patients are not here. For contrast-enhanced mammography, we can read them while the patient is sitting in our department. The number of times that I've done these exams and have shown the patients the images, have shown them when they're totally negative, in a patient with dense breast tissue is really comforting to these women to know, no, no, they can believe these results. Or similarly, in a patient where the contrast mammo is done for staging, I can say, no, no, don't worry. This, this area is isolated to this one small thing. You're good. The rest of your breasts are just fine. So um, this imaging modality allows us to maintain that communication with our patients, um, especially in this time where I think that that communication and connection is important. Patients also prefer contrast-enhanced MAMO. This was a study that we recently published. These are women who have a history of breast cancer, and we asked them, if both MRI and contrast MAMO have an equal chance of finding your breast cancer, which would you prefer? And you can see that a far majority, 73%, hopefully like my annotations, um, actually would prefer CEM. Only 10% um, preferred MRI. Another nice thing is that we don't have to do an MRI biopsy. So for anybody considering CEM, I would highly recommend that you get CEM biopsy. Um, I have not done it myself, but I've seen them and they are awesome. Um, CEM biopsy is just like a stereo biopsy. The patient experience is very similar. And at least what I have perceived is so much better than what women are going through for these MRI biopsies. So it allows us to divert patients from MRI biopsy to CEM biopsy. And that's, I think, an absolute game changer for this imaging modality. We're going to move on to talking about challenges of CEM. As I mentioned, you know, whenever we, we always have to talk about the challenges. There's always something that we need to discuss. And the main challenge of contrast enhanced MAMO really relates to contrast administration, as you would expect. So there is a real risk of contrast related events. This includes what we used to call uh, contrast induced nephropathy, and now it's called contrast associated or contrast induced acute kidney injury. Um, and it also includes extravasation of the contrast material in the arm after it's administered through the IV line. Um, Contrast-associated acute kidney injury or contrast-induced nephropathy is not really um, 
it's not really a thing anymore. Um, or I should say people are questioning whether it's really a thing anymore. And so some institutions are actually not even evaluating for underlying risk factors for contrast uh, for this contrast complication. That being said, the ACR contrast manual still, still treats it as an entity to be mindful of. And so you should talk to your individual institution to see how they navigate this. Do they test people's renal function? Before doing, uh, before administering contrast, or you can always, um, you can always refer to the ACR contrast manual for how to navigate this. There's also a challenge of contrast administration on workflow. Again, we have to place an IV line. We have to screen patients to make sure they are not going to, they're not at increased risk for developing a contrast reaction, and so um, that can impact the workflow through the department. Another challenge of contrast are um, false positives. So similar to MRI, areas that are benign can take up the contrast material. That's a challenge. Contrast mammography, when we look at it at the moment, it's really just, is there contrast or is there no contrast? We don't have all of the information that we have with MRI, you know, T2 signal and maybe even diffusion weighted sequences. And so, there's the real possibility to just see abnormal enhancement and to say, oh, this is concerning for breast cancer and we have to do something about it. So there are false positives. Let's look at an example of that. This was a 56 year old woman who had a history of left breast cancer that was treated with wide excision alone and she had new right breast calcification. So you can see there's the surgical bed on the left, I marked it. That was where the wide excision was done. And these are the new calcifications on the right. These are, this is the image showing you know, highly pleomorphic uh, linear branching calcifications, BIREDS 5. So we are worried about these for sure. These are the recombined images that show that there's abnormal enhancement associated with the new calcifications. Not surprising because this, these were concerning. They look like cancer. But what you'll also notice is that there's a mass enhancement in the surgical bed. And we saw this and we thought for sure this is going to be a recurrence. This patient didn't have radiation therapy. It was only wide excision. And so um, we thought this was going to be a recurrence. We ended up having an MRI because this was early on in our implementation. We can see the same thing on the right with those calcifications. We had enhancement. And we also saw mass enhancement in the surgical bed on the left. And it turned out that this was not recurrence because we did a biopsy. And we found that, that it was just post-treatment change in the area of fat necrosis. So this is an example of a false positive on contrast MAMO and MRI. Another challenge of contrast MAMO are false negatives. Um, false negatives happen because you have to remember that a contrast mammogram is still just a mammogram, right? We're still limited by what you can get on the detector. So sometimes you can miss lesions that are in the deep chest wall or in the medial breast. We're certainly not imaging the axilla, but that's not really the goal. Another reason for a false negative has to do with BPE, which is uh, background parenchymal enhancement. So we know from MRI that normal glandular tissue can take up contrast to varying degrees. Um, same thing happens on a contrast mammogram and you can see the image all the way on the left is minimal background parenchymal enhancement where there's almost no uptake of the contrast material as compared with marked background parenchymal enhancement, which is quite a bit of contrast uptake. So we have the same four categories on contrast MAMO as we do with MRI, minimal, mild, moderate, and marked. And you can imagine that when you have marked a lot of background parenchymal enhancement, it might be difficult to appreciate a solitary area of enhancement. And so this can be a reason for a false negative on contrast enhanced mammography. Another challenge of contrast MAMO, and this is really an, more of an implementation challenge, has to do with recombined only findings. We know from the literature that even if you see an abnormality on recombined imaging only, even if it's only one view, you have to take these seriously. One of the studies that was put out by Kim and colleagues showed that um, foci non-mass enhancement and mass enhancement had positive predictive values of at least 6%, um, all the way up to 40%. So you have to address these if you see them. And why that's an implementation challenge is that what happens, um, what do you do in these circumstances? The first thing you do is you have to identify, see if there's a low energy correlate because then maybe you can do a stereo or a tomosynthesis guided biopsy. Well, if you don't have that, 
you can do um, an ultrasound and see if you have a target for ultrasound guided core biopsy. But if you don't have that, then what do you do? So um, we used to send these patients to MRI to do an MRI biopsy. Now with contrast enhanced mammo biopsy, you can do that, but you have to know how you're gonna navigate these findings uh, once you implement contrast enhanced mammo because it's a real thing, it'll come up and you have to address it as well. At the very least, you would do a follow-up, which is not recommended. So this is like the whirlwind tour of contrast enhanced mammo. We're gonna move on to CEM and clinical practice. Um, let's start here. So um, there are a variety of clinical indications for contrast enhanced mammo. These are all diagnostic indications, as you'll notice, because I mentioned it's only approved in the diagnostic setting. And the last one on this list is high-risk supplemental screening. And that's because um, there are new recommendations that are allowing us to do contrast enhanced mammo in this setting, but it is not FDA approved, or at least allowing us, I should say, recommending as an alternative to MRI, and I'll get into that. For this talk, we're gonna focus on these first three um, indications, cancer staging, evaluate neoadjuvant chemotherapy response, and recall from screening. So this is the first case, finally some pictures. This is a 68 year old woman who was recalled for right breast architectural distortion. I'm not gonna show you the Tomo images. You can see the distortion is here marked by the yellow arrow. When we do the recombined images, you can see that there is a discrete mass here. And so this, this contrast mammo allowed us to both characterize the finding and also delineate extent. And that's really one of the uh, beautiful things about this imaging modality. It allows us to do both right at the time of the diagnostic exam. You can also do this after biopsy. So this was a grade two uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer. This is another case. This is a 68 year old woman who was recalled again for right breast architectural distortion. This is the area of distortion. It was a very subtle finding, not even worth showing you the 2D images uh, for this particular case. These were the recombined images that showed us for sure that there's an abnormality in this location, but it also showed us that there were other abnormalities located in both breasts. These were all malignant. So this is an example uh, for sure for architectural distortion. It helps us say, is this area something to worry about or not? And is there additional disease in other parts of the breast? We had an MRI, again, because this was um, during the earlier parts of our implementation. And you can see that these findings showed up on the MRI as well, and they were all malignant. So again, this really just highlights um, how similar the images are that we see on those recombined images to our MRI images, which is really why the sensitivities of the exam is so similar. This is another exam, but we've talked about distortion so far. This is a mass. This is a 75-year-old woman who had a history of bilateral breast cancer and recalled uh, for diagnostic CM for this right breast mass. Now this, what I liked about this case, we can all see the mass, it's marked by the yellow arrow. But what I liked about this case and why I'm showing it is because we know that once you have cancer treatment, it can distort the breast. It can be difficult to figure out what is just related to the surgery and what is new that we need to worry about and remove or treat. And so what the recombined images did for us is they just showed us where the cancer was. And all of those other areas of distortion related to the post-surgical changes just disappear. And this was a grade three uh, hormone receptor positive cancer. This is another um, example of contrast mammo. This was DCIS, this is for calcifications and calcifications are different than distortion of mass. And we'll talk about that. This was a patient with DCIS. You can see it was already biopsy. That was the clip. These are the calcifications linear branching, very, very suspicious, right? Not surprising this came back as DCIS. This person couldn't get an MRI for a disease extent. So we did a contrast mammogram. And what you'll notice is that the recombined images show no enhancement. So this is an example, and the reason why I'm, include, I'm including it, this is an example still of a positive contrast mammo because it's showing those calcifications, even though it's positive even though there's no enhancement here. And this is one of the challenge of contrast mammo for calcifications where some DCIS low-grade invasive ductal cancers might not show enhancement. We have to act on it anyway. So when thinking about cancer staging for calcifications, we don't actually use the recombined images to help us determine whether to do something about the calcifications. It's really to see, is there enhancement 
separate or beyond the area of calcifications that might impact the overall treatment plan. So in summary, here are a few um, studies that I'm just pulling out from the literature. Some can announce in 2019, they compared CEM to MRI for cancer staging, and they found that the sensitivities for the primary cancer site are 93% versus 91. And if you were to look through the literature, you would see this over and over again, these sensitivities being very similar to each other. Um, and they also found that both imaging modalities, CEM and MRI, overestimate the tumor size um, to a similar degree. And this overestimation is by a few millimeters. We are not talking about centimeters um, here. Lobes et al. Uh, more recently were looking at contrast-enhanced mammography and MRI, uh, and it's evalu their evaluation of ILC, which is invasive lobular cancer, and found that both of them overestimate ILC by around two millimeters, very similar. And then Lee and colleagues in 2021 looked, didn't, you know, I'm, I'm providing um, information not on how well they found the cancer, but on what the positive predictive value, which is really how well when you see something, on contrast MAM or MRI, is it likely to be cancer? And you'll see that the positive predictive value is much higher for CEM over MRI. And this, again, is kind of borne out over and over again, which is when you see an abnormality on contrast MAM, it is more likely to be breast cancer than when you see an abnormality on MRI. And this um, likely is because, again, it's a 2D, it's a, it's a planar projection. So if it, it becomes obvious enough for us to see it, um, then we should act on it uh, to a greater extent than with MRI. And um, yeah, that's the main, that's mainly what I have to say about that. So in general though, the take home point is that contrast enhanced mammography can be used as an alternative to MRI. So forgetting, you know, the data is there and this is what you should remember. So now we're gonna look at a different area, a different clinical indication, which, which is using contrast enhanced mammography to evaluate for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this was a patient who had a grade three um, HER2 positive breast cancer and had a positive lymph node. You can see the cancer marked by the thicker arrow and the node uh, marked by the longer, thinner arrow. And so this is an example where the contrast mammo was used to see how the patient responded to treatment. So these are the recombined images initially before treatment, which show you what you would expect, the cancer in the node. And this is what we see after treatment. So um, the images in yellow are the pre-treatment images and the images with the white annotations are post-treatment. And so on our low energy images, we can see that it looks like there's improvement. But you probably remember from other uh, talks on new adjuvant therapy where typically we categorize things as total response, no response, and a partial response, which has to be at least 30%. And so the question is, where does this fall in? Is this a partial response? Is this a total response? So we get our recombined images, which give us a much better sense as to how this patient has responded to the chemotherapeutic treatment. So there was a meta-analysis in 2023, so recent, that showed that the sensitivity for um, evaluating new adjuvant chemotherapy treatment response was actually better for CEM over MRI. And it showed that the specificity was actually a little bit worse, 68% to MRI, but they're always kind of balancing. You know, these, these two imaging exams are always kind of te teetering, like one is a little bit better, one is a little bit worse. Um, Bernardi and colleagues in 2022 showed that the CEM size measurements correlate highly with the size measurements on MRI. And studies show variable rates of over and under estimates for contrast MAMO and MRI, but always very similar. So it's hard to say, do they overestimate it by a few millimeters? Do they underestimate it by a few millimeters? I don't know what the exact answer for this is because the data is kind of, like I said, very variable. But the take home point is that these two imaging exams are very similar and that we can use contrast enhanced mammography as an alternative to MRI for any adjuvant chemotherapy treatment or something, especially for sure if you don't have MRI for sure, for sure. So now we're gonna look at recalls, which is um, an area that I really love using it for, especially for architectural distortion. So this was a really amazing case. A colleague of mine um, recalled this patient for exceptionally subtle distortion that was marked here by the yellow arrows on Tomo, really subtle. We brought her back for contrast enhanced mammo. Why do I like it? Well, if it's subtle distortion, Right, we know that distortion is subjective sometimes, right? So somebody can think that there's something there 
And I can look at it and say, I don't see it at all. And then there's another group, which is very obvious distortion. We all know that there's something going on. So for those subtle distortions, we always have this balance of, well, what do we do if our diagnostic imaging is negative? Then do we still go for a biopsy for the initially identified? You know, there's, there's so much question about what the next step should be. So the contrast mammogram helps us decide. It gives more information to help triage. Is this something to worry about or not? And then on the flip side, if it's one of those obvious areas of architectural distortion, it really helps for staging. So this is an example of subtle distortion. Is this real? Is it not real? We bring her back and look at that. These are the recombined images, which show a large area of segmental enhancement. And this was absolutely real. Um, there's no question about it. This was an invasive lobular cancer. And we could tell that there was something to worry about in seconds, minutes, I should say, the exam takes minutes. So the next example is recall for calcifications. And I already mentioned that you're gonna act on calcifications that are suspicious regardless of whether they're enhanced, there's enhancement or not. So the presence or absence of enhancement is only helpful if it's larger than the area of calcifications and it would impact your management. This patient had a very large area of calcifications throughout the central upper part of her left breast. You can see these calcifications here, they're pleomorphic. Right, these are coming out, they were biopsied, they're malignant. We do a recombined image, we see that there's associated enhancement. So like, what's the point of this? Well, it's helped us know that there's no enhancement in the lower part of the breast, right? We can see that the enhancement and at least the disease is isolated to this area of calcifications. And it's also given us information about the right breast. So when you consider evaluating con or using contrast mammo for calcifications, it's really to say, what, how is this going to help me? I'm already worried about the calcifications. I'm, I have to look for something more. And if the, that additional information will help me, then it's worth doing. This was DCIS. This was a recall for a possible mass. So there was the possible mass. You can see it better um, in the upper outer left breast. You can see it better on the MLO view. When you do the recombined images, you can see that there's this very discrete mass. I mean, look at that. This is a woman who has dense breast tissue, hard to differentiate anything, right? If there's a subtle mass located within the dense breast tissue. And then we do the recombined images and all the normal breast tissue goes away. And we see the mass, we see the size of it, we see the extent of it, and we can look at the contralateral breast and say, okay, this is really what we're talking about, this one small area. So now let's look at the data um, for architectural distortion. Again, this is an area that I really love. Patel and colleagues published the first study on this in 2017, and they said that um, Enhancement was associated with 30, I'm sorry, with 29 of the 30 cancers. So there was one cancer in their study that was not clearly associated with enhancement, but that person had marked background parenchymal enhancement. So it's difficult to know if it really wasn't associated with enhancement or just wasn't perceived to be associated with enhancement. In 2021, there was another study done on architectural distortion and said that if there was no enhancement, you do not have to worry about this thing. So between these two, the real take home is, if there is no enhancement in a patient who has no background parenchymal enhancement or very little background parenchymal enhancement, the likelihood that that is cancer is very, very low. Once somebody has a lot of background parenchymal enhancement where it can impact your perception, your identification of abnormal enhancement, you wanna be a little bit uh, more cautious. We're looking at calcifications. Most invasive breast cancers enhance, but there are some invasive or DCIS, uh, invasive cancers or DCIS that may not enhance. This is similar to MRI. And so we want to evaluate calcifications with suspicious, suspicious morphology regardless of enhancement. And I talked already a little bit about uh, when to use contrast enhanced mammo for these cases. Next, we'll talk about masses. Um, Masses that are associated with enhancement are more likely to be malignant. If a mass has no, if you have a mass on a low energy exam and there's no associated enhancement, the negative predictive value is very high. And that's no different than if you see a mass on a 2D mammogram and you do an MRI and you see no enhancement. That's the likelihood that that is a cancer is essentially zero. I mean, there is no, it's, it's the negative predictive value of an absence of enhancement for a mass is very, very, very high. 
So we talked about uh, some of the clinical indications, how people are using it, some of the data. Now we're going to talk about where things are headed in the future. Um, there are three main areas that we're talking about, which is breast cancer screening, using contrast MAMO um, in the diagnostic setting just to formalize those indications a little bit, and then radiomics, which is AI and machine learning, and really, really neat stuff is happening. So we'll talk about breast cancer screening. This is, um, this is a topic that I think most of us who use contrast MAMO, most of us, most people who, who see talks on contrast MAMO, this is the area that we're most excited about, especially for women who have dense breast tissue, who are at high risk, maybe they don't qualify for an MRI. Can we do a better job at finding breast cancers for these women above what we're already able to do for tomosynthesis with tomosynthesis and ultrasound? So this is a patient um, who has is high risk for breast cancer. She had a contrast mammal. This is a screening exam. You'll see the um, low energy images were negative. And then we do the recombined images and you can see um, a hormone receptor positive cancer in the right breast. And so this is kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about identifying cancers that we would otherwise miss on our conventional imaging. I mean, this is, this is why we're excited about MRI. So um, the problem is that the data is, uh, is not yet there where we can do contrast mammo for screening. Certainly it has not been FDA approved for this indication. So let's talk about the data. Um, we have retrospective studies, reader studies, and then there's CMIS, CMIS which is really, really excellent, that have already been, um, CMIS is, is happening now, but there are some retrospective and reader studies that are out. So Soren and colleagues in 2018 compared contrast enhanced mammography, the full exam, low energy and recombined images, to um, the low energy alone, which is kind of a surrogate for mammography. And they found an additional 13 breast cancers per thousand women screened. 2019, the MSK group looked at their data for contrast mammo and they found a cancer detection rate of 15 per thousand women screened, which is much higher than the standard uh, cancer detection rate, rates we typically talk about with mammo or with tomosynthesis, which is about you know, three to five, three to six breast cancers per thousand. There's also retrospective studies on uh, women who have had a history of breast cancer, those that are above average risk, women who have dense breast, history of lobular neoplasia, and they all say the same thing, which is that contrast mammo does a better job than conventional mammo. CMIS, though, is really going to be um, the test, the trial that helps differentiate should we be doing this. It's a prospective trial. It's a multi-center trial. What CMIS is doing, it's recruiting about 2,000 women. These women are getting both tomosynthesis and contrast mammo, and it's going to be able to see what the difference is in cancer detection and also what the difference is in false positives because that impacts um, our view of whether this is a good screening test. And they'll track, um, you know, contrast reactions and what so that we can really get an overall look at how this modality plays for women who have dense breast tissue, the good and the bad, and compare it and see if this is something we want to do. The results of that should be out in a few years. It's very exciting. Uh, stay tuned. My group published um, a trial more recently that compared contrast enhanced MAMO to MRI for breast cancer screening. We had 132 CEM and MRI exams in an asymptomatic uh, population of women. 132, that's a huge number. And we had 12 people, 12 radiologists look at all of these exams. And we compared the performance metrics. And what we found as expected is that CEM performed a little bit worse than the full MRI protocol. You can see CEM sensitivity was 89%, whereas the full MRI was at 94%. But look at the sensitivity of 2D mammography, which was 70, 75%, much lower. Um, we found that the specificity of contrast mammo was higher than the full MRI protocol, which again is what we'd expect. Fewer false positives when we see something on, that, on an MRI, on a contrast mammo, it's more likely to be breast cancer. And when we look at that metric of accuracy, which is AUC, to see how, what the balance is between cancer detection and um, not finding benign things, we see that actually the, the accuracy is very similar between both of these exams. And we confirmed that contrast enhanced mammography is not inferior to breast MRI. And this was great. I mean, we looked at a lot of cases and we had a lot of people look at it. And so this helps perpetuate the idea 
move forward the idea that these two exams are very, very similar overall. Unfortunately, again, as I mentioned before, we don't have enough data yet to, um, to really embrace this fully for breast cancer screening. Certainly the organizations that guide us have not done so. And so really um, where we're at for screening is the ACR has acknowledged that CM has value, but that there's limited data. And so it's really only recommending it when MRI cannot be performed. I imagine this will change over time, but this is where we stand today. The NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, has a similar approach, really use contrast mammo for breast cancer screening when you can't perform an MRI. Same thing with USOBI, which is the European Society of Breast Imaging. So that's kind of where we're at. I imagine that will um, things will change over time, as I mentioned. Another area to um, for the future is there's a we're going to look at how contrast mammo specifically applies to palpable lumps, pathologic nipple discharge, high risk screening evaluation, and screening recalls. More studies to see to see how it compares to our standard of care. There's a great trial called, um, it's called the RACER trial, Rapid Access to Contrast Enhanced Spectral Mammography in Women Recalled from Breast Cancer Screening. This trial um, is doing, is randomizing patients to standard of care, which is mammography ultrasound versus CEM. And they're gonna look at what the different performance is in terms of cancer detection, follow-ups, biopsies, et cetera. Uh, missed cancers. So that is gonna be really one of, of this is going to, the results of this trial are going to be really great to help us figure out, is contrast mammo better? Maybe it has a slightly better or better cancer detection rate, but maybe um, there are other challenges that we need to be mindful of. Lastly, for future directions, we're going to talk about radiomics. Uh, radiomics are really looking at differentiating cancer subtypes, trying to figure out, can we use contrast mammo and the contrast that we see on these images to differentiate benign from malignant disease? And lastly, to evaluate axillary metastases. Overall, the wonderful thing is that CM guided core biopsy is now available. You can get it. It's amazing. Um, I'll show you an example of how that's used. I know we're running out of time. So this was a patient who had a recombined only finding. Um, let me show you this. So this was a patient who had architectural distortion in the left breast, marked by that yellow arrow. And we did a biopsy, a tomosynthesis guided biopsy, and you'll see that our clip is actually not where the tomosynthesis, where the architectural distortion was. So we weren't sure what to do about this. Did we sample appropriately the distortion and the clip moved, or were we just off? And this can happen with tomosynthesis guided biopsy. I imagine everybody on the call, or at least many people on the call have had this issue. So we did a contrast memo to get more information. And we found that there was no enhancement in the area of distortion, which is great, but there was enhancement in the right breast. The enhancement here marked by the pink color was a fibroadenoma, a known fibroadenoma, but you'll see that there was actually an incidental enhancement in the um, outer central right breast. And this was, this was a malignancy. So, but what were, you know, what are we going to do with this thing? We sent her to ultrasound. We couldn't find it. There was no associate correlate on the low energy exam. So we had to send this patient to MRI. Um, but now with contrast enhanced mammo biopsy, we'll be able to do that. Another notable change is that there's now a lexicon for how to interpret the imaging findings, which obviously I've not gone into any information about how to interpret the images that we see. Mostly the lexicon is based on, is built around the low energy images being similar to mammography and the recombined images being similar to MRI. So the lexicon is really geared towards mammography and MRI uh, characteristics. The main changes are that there's now no focus. There's no, the, the term focus is not included in the CM lexicon. We don't have the characteristics of um, dark internal septations, clustered ring, and we've added a term called an enhancing asymmetry, which is the finding that you see, an area of enhancement that you see only on one view. And so with that, this is the summary of the talk. I'm actually not gonna stay on this slide too long because I know we're running out of time. And I want to give people a chance to ask some questions. So you can always learn more. These are some, there are some books available, websites, journal articles, and feel free to reach out with questions anytime. Thanks so much for your lecture, Dr. Phillips. At this time, we will open the floor for some questions. You can submit those through the Q&A feature.
and we will try to get through as many as we can. We have a few coming in and I will go ahead and open this up. How much iodinated contrast do we administer for CEM? Um, so the dose of contrast is largely, um, so it's weight-based. And so um, the actual dose is built around the patient who walks in the door. So we weigh the patients and the imaging units, you plug in the weight and it tells you what the dose should be. Often enough, institutions have a maximum dose that they administer. So our maximum dose is 150 cc's, ml, I should say. The if you, weight based, I'm sorry, the weight-based um, calculation is 1.5 cc's per kilogram. Thank you. If you work up an asymmetry with CEM and see no enhancement, how confident can you be that the asymmetry is benign? Does it become BIRADS 3 or BIRADS 2? So um, that this is a really great, great question. And it's one of the challenges of contrast mammos. What do you do with these enhanced, what we call now enhancing asymmetries, which are areas of enhancement on one view only? And the answer is, is really you need to be concerned about it. I would not blow these off. Um, so typically what we do now is you look at your low energy images and you see if there's a mammo correlate to help you figure out, is this enhancement Perhaps it's associated with an area on the 2D mammogram that's been there for 10 years, in which case, yes, it's enhancing, but you're using the other features to tell you, no, no, it's enhancing associated with a benign finding. But if you are not able to get um, a low energy correlate, then you would do a targeted ultrasound. But I would say you do not necessarily call it a BIREDS 3 or BIREDS 2. You would, you would want to work it up. And then if you absolutely have no correlate on your mammo or ultrasound, then um, what we had been doing before CM biopsy was actually sending the patient to MR to further evaluate it. And now that CM biopsy is around, you can do a CM biopsy. Very rarely do I follow it. Thank you. Does CEM have the same sensitivity for non-mass enhancement comparable to MRI? This is in regard to high-grade DCIS. I don't have the answer for that question, specifically to non-mass enhancement. Okay. Um, can you clarify, does CEM only use 2D and not TOMO images? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So CEM is a planar exam. It's just 2D. So um, when the exam is acquired, think about your 2D mammos, and um, that's exactly how it's done. There's no TOMO sweep. There are people that are talking about contrast-enhanced uh, TOMO synthesis, where during the TOMO sweep, you're performing your dual energy images. There are few people that have studied that, but that's not available now. Got it. We've got two questions in the insurance reimbursement billing area. Can you speak to your experience on, on this? Do you have to get pre-authorization prior to performing? No. How do you feel? Okay. No, it's billed as a diagnostic mammogram plus the administration of contrast. So it's just a diagmamo. And then the contrast often enough, depending on where you work, hospital or non-hospital related, you may or may not get reimbursed for the contrast. The contrast is roughly like $12. So at the moment, that is um, how it's billed. And there's not typically an insurance coverage issue. I hope that I've answered, you know, the people that have questions about reimbursement, I hope, hope I've answered them. We all would like to get reimbursed more. And have a dedicated CPT code for it, but that's not, that's not happening. That's not a thing yet. All right. Um, does the compression affect the enhancement? I think whoever asked that question, I'm interested to know, I, to know what you're specifically asking about. So, um, the, so the degree of compression I can't answer. I can only say that a contrast mammogram is is done where you administer the contrast with the patient sitting and then you do the mammogram. So the patient gets put in compression after the contrast is administered. That is how these exams are done. And so at the moment, it does not seem to impact our ability, our, our um, capability of seeing the enhancement. Now, I cannot answer the question about like the degree of compression and how it impacts. 
in your experience with any surgeons, have they liked CEM versus pre-op MRI? Oh my God. Our surgeons love it. Every surgeon that I've spoken to has loved it. And I think that the challenge, um, the, the reason why the surgeons love it is because one of the challenges of MRI is yes, MRI is, is an amazing tool. And I really don't want to diminish it because it's been, you know, an amazing boon for our, um, for our field. It finds many cancers, but it also finds a lot, a lot of non-cancers. And these women are going for more biopsies, more stress, which is associated with more stress. And so our surgeons are really liking it because if we see an abnormality, we can do something about it. There are fewer false positives, fewer extra visits. And so they appreciate the ability to identify just what we need to know and not anything more. Surgeons love it. And it doesn't delay care. You know, you can do it right in the mammo suite. Awesome. Right. They're talking That's about it at their conferences too. Uh, contrast mammo. Awesome. Can we do dynamic contrast enhanced study enhancement curve with CEM? So um, that is not a part of the exam currently. We do not do that currently. There are a number of studies that have looked at looking at how the breast takes up contrast or how a lesion takes up contrast over time to help us differentiate cancer from not cancer. That has not been um, included in our current interpretation of the exam. It's not as consistent as it is with MRI where you're looking at the breast you know, you're looking at every portion of the breast at, at a same time, you know, at the same time over multiple time periods. What do you do with multiple small foci of less than five millimeters of enhancement? On MRI or on contrast MAMO? I think it's about contrast MAMO. Um, I, you know, so, so this is also an interesting question because with MRI, when MRI was started, there were a lot more follow-ups. And the reason why there were more follow-ups for this specific indication is because we didn't have the data to say, oh, this is just BPE versus not. And I would say at the moment, the, the standard practice for this is variable among practices and how comfortable you are. Um, if you were to see multiple scattered enhancing foci, none of which stood out as being definitively different than everything else, I would just call it a BIREDS2 in background. Um, if there was one that really looked a little bit different, or if I couldn't tell, is there something here that I'm missing and I'm questioning certain areas, then I would do a follow-up and comfortable doing a follow-up because I don't have the same amount of data, long-term data to say, oh, this is really just all background, being able to differentiate background from it, from an abnormal enhancement. So I'd say the short answer is I am comfortable if I see multiple scattered um, areas of enhancement, which we call foci, less than five millimeters, all throughout the breast, calling it marked BPE and not doing more for it. If there's one specific area I'm questioning something, I would also feel comfortable doing a follow-up. Thank you. All right, I'll ask two more questions and we'll let you go. You've got tons of questions here. Um, do you always repeat CEM after biopsy to confirm clip placement? Is that after a CEM biopsy? I, I, if oh, it's after question. a CEM biopsy, I'm not able to answer that question. We don't routinely, in general, I do not perform CEM after biopsy to confirm clip placement. Um, and for CEM biopsy, I can't answer that because I don't do those. So I cannot tell you what I would normally do. Is there a recommended time frame for image acquisition in CEM after contrast administration? So the standard thought is that two minutes from the start of the injection is when you start acquiring the pictures. And you want to image within 10 minutes to make sure that the contrast material that's in the breast is still there. Hasn't washed out yet. Okay, one more question. In young patients with breast cancer, do you prefer MR over CEM? So for newly diagnosed breast cancer, I would say that Currently, my answer largely has to do with logistics. And it has to do with when the patient's going to be able to come in for the MR, when the patient's going to be able to come in for contrast. Often enough, if I see a young woman who's coming in, 
um, we will do the contrast mammo right at the time of the diagnostic exam. And so I don't actually have to bring the patient back for a contrast mammo or an MRI. If I've already done a workup and then I've diagnosed the cancer and I'm now doing a contrast study for extended disease, it really would be a logistical choice and the location of the uh, cancer. So if the cancer is located deep within the breast or medial, then, um, then I would choose MRI. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for answering all those questions. And thank you for your lecture today. That was wonderful. Appreciate you being here. Absolutely. I'm happy to. If anybody has any other questions, I don't know. I really have not been following to see what other questions there are, but anybody should feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thanks to everyone else for participating in our new conference today and all the amazing questions. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous new conferences by creating a free MRI account. You'll also receive a replay of this lecture in your email shortly uh, after we are finished here. Be sure, sure to join us next week on Thursday, February 1st at 12 p.m. Eastern for a live noon conference featuring Dr. Dennis Balecki for a lecture entitled Introduction to Arthritis. You can register for this free lecture at mrnline.com. Follow us on social medias for future new conference updates. Thanks again and have a great day.